Hello and welcome to Heilman and Haver, the stage and screen podcast episode 31, coming to you virtually from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios in beautiful Port Orchard, Washington. I'm Greg Heilman. And I'm Matt Haver. We're two local actors looking to hone our craft by exploring the best in local theater and on the big screen. Each week we bring you entertainment news and views, celebrate classic Hollywood, enjoy cocktails with a Tinseltown twist, interview talented local actors and directors, and chat with industry experts from L.A. to the U.K. Coming up in a few moments is the second half of our interview with Tommy Kurzman, makeup and prosthetics designer for Mrs. Doubtfire, the new musical comedy. But first, we wanted to catch our list local listeners up on a few events happening in the area. Thanks to everyone who came out to the historic Roxy Theater in Bremerton, Washington for the first installment of the Movies of the Decade and the showing of Citizen Kane last weekend. Coming up next is Rebel Without a Cause from 1955, starring James Dean. We'll be hosting, and we hit the stage at 6, along with our good friend Jeremy Arnold, who will join us virtually for his intro to this film. Tickets are just $11, so visit roxybremerton.org forward slash showtimes to purchase tickets, and it's also linked in the show notes. It's a totally new experience seeing these classic films uh, as they were meant to be seen on the big screen, and if you're looking to have your film shown on the big screen, enter the 2021 West Sound Film Festival. It'll be held August 6th through 8th of this year at the Roxy, and submissions are open now and will be accepted through the end of the month. For more info and to submit your project, visit westsoundfilmfestival.com and stay tuned right here for festival news and interviews. And make sure to tune into our YouTube channel for our latest edition of In the Mix. We're back at the Bay Street Bistro this week celebrating the June 1st birthday of Marilyn Monroe and her 1959 film co-starring Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis, Some Like It Hot. And if you like it hot, you'll love this week's cocktail, a spicy little number that may or may not include hot sauce. The Bistro will be featuring the drink this Sunday, June 6th, as part of their Sunday supper, along with a special menu. So tune into the mix, catch up on your Some Like It Hot trivia, and call for a reservation. Well, we had a lot of fun last week getting to know Tommy Kurzman and learning about his journey as makeup, hair, and prosthetics artist on Broadway. Thanks to the magic of pre-recording, he returns to the show this week to talk more about Mrs. Doubtfire and the future of Broadway post-COVID. As we mentioned, Tommy is the makeup and prosthetics designer for Mrs. Doubtfire, the new musical comedy, which debuted in Seattle, moved to New York, was shut down by COVID, and we're happy to say begins previews this October and officially opens on Broadway December 5th. Boy, what a journey. Uh, he also recently designed wigs and makeup for the New York City revival of Little Shop of Horrors, one of our favorites. His makeup, prosthetics, hair, and wig design skills have contributed to over 15 other Broadway shows, including All My Sons, True West, St. Joan, My Fair Lady, Little Foxes, Long Day's Journey in Tonight, Bright Star, King Kong, The King and I, and Fiddler on the Roof, along with many other off-Broadway and regional shows. We rejoin Tommy from his home studio in New Jersey. So once the show opens, how hands-on are you? Are you backstage putting the prosthetics and the wigs on uh, someone like Rob? No. So if I'm the designer, I'm there all through tech, and then I'll be in and out through previews, obviously depending on how things are going and what's needed. But then I wouldn't really be hands-on unless there was to be an issue. Or if like a new, like say, and this is my hope, and I don't know, but I'm sure they will hire uh, Mrs. Doubtfire who will be, you know, of color, of a different ethnicity, you know, like, so all of those things are then going to affect like the color of the face, looking at the face shape again, what are we going to alter? What are we going to change? So that's kind of the only time as a designer, like even with hair, depending on what kind of show it is, like. You know, when I worked with Tom for so long, something like Wicked that I'm wearing a Wicked (laughs) t-shirt, something like that, that is like a well-oiled machine. And like, no matter who the actor is coming in, there's like a set track, a set look, then you don't need to really go in because you know what you know what it needs to be. It's when people come into a show and you have to alter it for some reason, you know, like whether the person who's leaving the show is a blonde, but the person coming in is a brunette and the director doesn't want them to be a blonde. So are we going to, you know, like what, there's all that kind of stuff. That's when you go back in. But once the show's frozen and open, you know, then as far as design wise, everything's been settled. And, you know, you let, that's why having a good hair supervisor or makeup supervisor, which we do on Delphire, we have a great team. Like, you trust them. There's not a question that those people that are there aren't capable if, you know, something was to come up, you know? Yeah. So I saw that little, so you have little shop that's opening up in September and then Mrs. Doubtfire later in the fall. So you have two shows. So 
that doesn't necessarily impact you're you're already working from a design perspective on the next thing right and those shows are opening with your designs but you've got you're not really involved in them at that point yes and no because like because of covid you know some actors aren't coming back to little shop some they've already announced the cast there's a few there's an actress who's coming back from the, when we originally opened but in a different role so that has a different look so there is that and then also Delphire because we were only on our third preview I will be going back in because they're you know they've had a year to adjust the book they've rewritten some music they there's work that's been done so as a whole and as a company we're treating Doubtfire like we're doing it again okay hmm. so there will be a rehearsal there will be previews there will you know like it's not like something like Phantom or something that's just gonna go back in they'll rehearse to make sure everyone's safe all the costumes fit, and then the show's up and moving. I saw it twice here in Seattle, and uh, was as a as a huge fan of the show. It's it's actually our, the movie. It's my favorite movie, uh, certainly my favorite comedy. I loved it. I went into it a little a little wary, almost as a as a huge fan, like I know you are. What are they going to do with this great story? And it just knocked it out of the park. The message of family and love, and the 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 musicianship, and the the athleticism. Of it was unbelievable. I was just blown away. So I hope everybody listening on the East Coast will will go and see it as soon as possible. And and once you get back with the cast, uh, anybody who wants to come on a little old podcast from the Seattle area, you let them know. Send send them our direction. <laughs> oh yeah, that's not an issue. I totally will do that. So how much time did you spend in Seattle when you were when you were doing that? Did you get an apartment out here and, and spend? You know. Yeah, the company was great. They housed us. I was there. I think it was a month, a whole month. I got there the second day we were in the theater was my birthday. (laughs) I was like, oh, great. Here we are. Yeah, it was my 30th birthday. And I was like, I'm in tech. I can't do anything. (laughs) But how great. Yeah. And I mean, Seattle was great. And the theater community there is so supportive. And, you know, it really felt like it had the right group of people to really put that support and oomph that you need under a new work Mm -hmm. because like even you said like and I thought the same thing not you know obviously I don't want to work on something that I think is going to fail or be set up to fail but there's an expectation we all as people have seen movies turn into musicals and be like why did they do that yeah like why like leave it alone and it's like this I was actually like it's giving it a whole new life Absolutely right. There's people that, you know, obviously if you're interested in theater and stuff, like you probably know it because, I mean, it's amazing, the movie. But it, again, with what we just went through as a community for an entire year, coming back full throttle to a show that is about inclusivity, you know, family, love, equality, togetherness, like, it just feels like what, we need right now i agree it's just again it's so weird how the universe works because if we would have been up and running and whatever i don't think we would it would have the same it wouldn't come across the same way you know like people are ready to go back and have a good time and you know like yeah it's about togetherness and that's what we need (laughs) Well, and I love the fact that throughout the the pandemic and everything, uh, the shutdown, uh, the cast was was going online and doing you know singalongs and updates, and they kept that momentum going. And it oh, appe- yeah. it appears at least that the original Seattle cast is intact. I- am I right? Oh yeah, that's just that's so fantastic. I think Jen, who plays Miranda, she's another amazing human being. I mean, really, the fact that the two of them lead the cast is like. You know, it starts at the top. You have the producers who are so supportive and amazing and want to do it, do right by everyone and everything. Then you have the director. You know, you have literally have everybody who is like gung ho. And so Jen set up, it was every Friday or every, every last Friday of every month. We had Zoom, like where we just get on and like, how are you doing? What's up? What you having for dinner over there? Oh, what did you do this week? You know, like, and literally like a family, like just to be like, we're checking in, you know, 
unfortunately, we lost one of our cast members. We lost Doreen Montalvo. And so that's the whole, you know, we were able to kind of talk and grieve together. And, hmm. you know, the show will recognize her. And it's been a really, really great experience with people and community. And it's just, it just goes to show, like, this is what the show is about. And that's how the people who are creating the show treat each other. Like, it is literally like a product of love and equality. And, you know, I don't know. It's... It sounds like cheesy, but <laughs> no, it's a very special show. I, I can yeah. attest to that. I, I went and saw it once with my wife and it was so great. I had to come back and for Christmas presents, I bought my 13 and 10 year old daughter's tickets and we went again. Oh. And it was oh. like, it, it is one of those memories I will always treasure. Yeah. I hope they were like, how did they get him? Make, how did they make him a woman so fast? Oh, they were, they were amazed. <laughs> they sat there completely enthralled the entire time. <laughs> Magic. Literally. Magic, that's how one of, one of the like, the things I'll never forget is the first day, you know, obviously we've changed things from Seattle as far as like the face and stuff and did what we could do to, you know, everyone always wants to be better. We want to make it better. And you've had a lot of downtime to think about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. But like the, the minute that door opens, the front door swings open and Doubtfire is standing there, the gas, the yell from it literally like, It makes me want to cry because I'm just like, okay, like we did this. We all did this. Like, this is amazing. It gave me chills, to be honest, Um, especially in light of, you know, losing Robin Williams. Uh, It was, wow, his spirit is here. And uh, the thing I appreciated about Rob and, and the rest of the cast, too, they didn't try to be the movie. They brought a completely fresh take to the characters, to the storyline. It was updated iPads, things like that, because. The movie, yeah. you know, it's 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 a few years old now, but uh, no, I I really was. It was very very touching uh, and very memorable. It's one that I would fly to New York just to see. Well, we'll be waiting. Awesome, <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> Greg, you're coming too, buddy. We're gonna we'll broadcast from out there. There you go. Yeah, it's it's interesting the number and and from a from a Seattle perspective, because um, I've been out here probably I guess it'll be seven years, and I didn't know how strong the theater scene was, but there's a good seven, eight, or nine shows, including. You know, Mrs. Doubtfire, Come From Away, Aladdin, Catch Me If You Can, shows that's premiered in Seattle before moving yeah. to, to Broadway. So, you know, there, there's a number of these little hubs across the country. I know New Jersey's got what's the Paper Mill Playhouse and you've got yeah. um, in, in, in California. But it's nice to see Seattle as kind of a, a, a nice little hub for shows premiering before they head out to Broadway. Well, and also look at all the shows that have been there and how successful they have been once they left there. It's like clearly the theater community in Seattle, they're as a production are able to get the information they need to make their shows better, to make them whatever to then, I mean, they're running come from away is coming back. Aladdin coming back, you know, like, look at it. It's still. So that speaks to the group of people that are out there and are responding to the different shows. Now, Tommy, did you guys, uh, did you know uh, from the outset that this was Broadway bound or was there an announcement at Um, some point during the show's run that, yes, we are indeed headed to Broadway? And how did that feel when you found out? Yeah, I think from the get go, they knew they were coming. I'm pretty, I mean, and also too, that's why they hired Because a lot of times, like out of town, out of town tryouts, as they call them, sometimes they'll have a different creative team sometimes. But they literally went for like the bee's knees as far as the production quality. And so we knew, I'm pretty sure it was from the beginning. We definitely knew before we went. I don't know if it was from the beginning from when it was announced, but we, we knew it was coming in. So that also puts the pressure on. Yeah, I bet. I bet it. <laughs> You're like, oh, honey, I don't want to mess this one up. Like, <laughs> we just raised the bar. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, we've got a, a friend, Greg. Uh, Greg's good friend, uh, Dr. Jason Kint out there. We call him Dr. Broadway. He's at every show every night and uh, works with the uh, the Actors Fund. And uh, we're going to have him uh, joining us this summer on a like, biweekly basis to give us updates on the new shows. So we're really excited to get his take on, on Doubtfire. We talked about it. Oh, he was on several months ago, and he was already excited uh, to go and see I love that. Yep. Doubtfire. Yeah. I know. I Actually, I was working on a TV show today. We were filming in Manhattan. And I 
walked past the theater afterwards and I was just like oh my goodness like it's so weird because no one's been like our stuff is in there you know what I mean like when the theater shut down I took my makeup kit and stuff home but I like all of the mask all the car everything all the wig it's all sitting in the theater well what's it what's the mood like when we talked to Jason in, in January and it was kind of in the middle of the shutdown and it was just quiet i mean the restaurants were all closed all because there's so many we talked about all the different ancillary businesses that are dependent on broadway and are things starting to come back a little bit i mean when you, when you walk around yeah is- i mean today you wouldn't have thought nothing ever happened people out bryant park packed the streets packed i took you know a bus home back to new jersey it was you know full it's amazing i've been vaccinated for like a month and a half now and i mean i still wear my mask outside just you know in case like who knows but i mean really you feel like today was the first time in a long time that i've been in the city that really i was like wow like this feels like we never left you know like Mm -hmm. nothing ever happened but i will say it and i do hope that once people are comfortable and things settle and you know everything is really really under control that you know, those small business, it's hard already to be in a place like New York City and not be a chain and not be, you know, to survive and kind of live on your own. But that's what makes New York so special. And especially like the theater district, you know, there's so many little restaurants that have so many, so much history, you know, that some of them had to close because I mean, money, like they say, money don't grow on trees. And, you know, you have to, do we keep the business open or do we pay our mortgage on our house? Like where, where are we, you know? And so I'm just hoping that with shows coming back and everyone being a little bit more hopeful and vulnerable and, you know, comfortable that they can come back because there are there, you know, even walking past the theater, there's a lot of, you know, space for rent, retail space available, this, that, and the other thing. So what's next for you? You're you're going back to 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 Doubtfire. Uh, you've got the wig there in front of you. You're working on now. Is that for TV or is that for a film? This is for. I mean, I don't know nowadays because I think it's, I think it's a street. It's it's a it's going to be an episodic, okay. but it's going to be street. It's not going to be like on television. It's going to be like I don't know if it's Netflix or what kind of streaming service is going to run it. That's the new normal. <laughs> yeah so i'm like is it film or tv i don't really know <laughs> that's that's a good point that's one of the things matt and i've been trying to wrap our heads around since we started this podcast kind of this what is the future of all of this media stuff because with all the streaming what is film what is tv netflix has both so you can have yeah. a netflix show does it go for an emmy does it go for an oscar you know it's on the screen that's yeah it's, it's on a screen it's <laughs> yeah. not on stage it's on a screen <laughs> there you, you watch go it on yeah. a phone <laughs> Well, see, Greg, we were ahead of the times. It was the stage and screen podcast. That's see, right. Honey, <laughs> see, the universe works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Just didn't know what kind of screen we were talking about. Now, do, you, do you have any other stage uh, endeavors in the near future? Other, other than Doubtfire, obviously. Yeah, so I'm actually going out to a place that I've always wanted to work since I, when I worked with Tom, I would go out and work at the Opera Theater of St. Louis in St. Louis, Missouri. And I did that for eight summers. And so while I was out there, you know, they have their version of Central Park, which is called Forest Park. And there's a, an 11,000 outdoor theater, seat outdoor theater called the Muni that's out there. So I'm going to design two shows out there this summer. Oh, fun. Which ones are they? I'm doing Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and, nice. Chica- and Chicago. Oh, cool. I think it's their last, it's the last, Chicago, is, I believe, is the last show. And then Seven Brides is the second, how do you know? So there's one between the two, but they're at the end of the season. Quite a bit of variety, but quite a bit of, I would assume, wig work for those two. Yeah, and what's great is, like, it's the Muni, and like I said, it's 11,000 seats. So when you're, you know, just like you would be doing in scenic design, everything's to scale. So you think about hair on a stage that is basically a baseball stadium yeah has to look different up close than a wig on a stage that has a thousand seats 
How now? How would you describe the difference? What uh, what's the process for you like? Well, I think everything. You know, if it's a hairdo, it has to be bigger. It has to be. You know, you can't. It's going to be interesting, and I think it will be a challenge and a challenge that I'm like ready to figure out with something that's like Chicago, where it's period and there's finger waves, and those are styles that are very tight. Mm-hmm. But like, how do we make it so that it doesn't just look like a helmet right from a distance you know what i mean like where it still looks like hair and it still has movement and it's interesting you know like stuff like that still looks good through opera glasses <laughs> yeah honey always because you know what they'll be taking photos and look from stage to screen so we right. need to make sure our stuff looks good <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean i'm doing that and then i'm gonna do a show that was postponed from obviously last fall Oh, I'm doing All Wilderness at Hartford Stage in Hartford, Connecticut. And then, you know, everyone's still kind of waiting because it's like if Broadway has just announced their dates, smaller theaters that have not as much funding, I think are going to hang on a second before they start announcing shows and jobs and things. And then hopefully I get phone calls. If not, if you're looking for an intern, I might be available. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a question for you, Tommy. So we, we spoke with a Foley artist a couple of weeks ago, Greg Barbanel, and he was talking about the mindset that he's got when he goes to antique shops and he's always looking for what makes certain sounds and, and ooh, that, that sounds interesting. I could use that. Is it the same when you're looking at, you know, your designs that you're looking at materials and you're looking at designs all the time you're kind of always in that designer mindset yeah i mean it's like you'll go to a flea market you know you'll be out of town visiting a family member and you'll go to a flea market and someone will have a pile of books and like it'll be portraits of the 1930s and i'll buy it because you know realistic i like to have tangible things like the internet is great but there's a lot of like we all know about wikipedia and how like you you can go on and edit it So it's like for photos, if you Google like 1930s hairstyles, you might find something that isn't accurate. So if you're looking for that true period stuff, it's always best, you know, I even have friends who send me their family, photos of their families, family members from that time or from whatever, because it's so real, you know, not everything was the Hollywood version And so what does that look like, you know, 1930s on a farm in Nebraska? We know what 1930s in Hollywood looks like, but we don't, you know, what does that, the real part look like? Good point. If if you need pictures of people from Nebraska, that's where one side of my family comes. So I've got lots of photos. So open up the drop (laughs) book, drop box and just fill it up. (laughs) All right. Sounds good. I will. (laughs) Some good good stuff or good stock. (laughs) Exactly. And I mean, it even comes down to like tools, you know, like, they'll be doing a show and it's like, okay, well there's a scene where she's in her bedroom. So she has makeup stuff at her vanity and hairbrush. What do those look like? They always come knocking in the room. I'm like, that's a prop. That's not my job. But like, (laughs) but to have that information is like, it's helpful because then again, you're helping the other people in your, you know, in with your show, everyone's doing the same thing. They want it to be the best show. So if you have the information, you know, the better off you are. You mentioned tool. What is the one tool that you use the most or the one tool that somebody looking to get into hair and makeup and, and design needs to have? This. That looks like, that looks like a crude dentist instrument. It's this, <laughs> if people can't see it. It's this little, you know, it's got a handle and it's a little kind of hookish. Uh-huh. This is a ventilating hook. So this is what we use. It's actually like a crochet hook, but in the smallest form. So at the very end of this hook is like a hook that, I mean, I've gotten this stuck in my finger, in my face. It doesn't, you have to rip it out because it gets stuck in there. And so this is what ties the hair into the lace when you're making like, you know, you're making a wig. You're, you know, you have to tie all the hair into that lace. So that's the tool I use and any wig maker uses the most. I mean, this is this doesn't leave our hand. For people who are interested in seeing your work, I know you've got some photos up on Instagram. I was uh, perusing them earlier. Incredible. Uh, it, it, Thank just you. Completely natural. I don't know how anybody would be able to tell that this isn't someone's natural hair. I was uh, impressed. 
Thanks. And I'm actually really starting to find and harp on the fact that like, I even tell people, you know, I'll, I'll have, because doing wigs and stuff, you have clients that might not be in the theater. They might be celebrities. They might be actors that want to have a wig made to go on a red carpet. They might, whatever. I always tell people, I'm like, I like to think of myself that I make hair, not wigs. Because wigs get such like a negative connotation because we all know like you can go on Amazon and type in blonde wig. And yes, you can in fact order a blonde wig, but you're not going to fool anybody. That's a wig. The biggest compliment a hair designer can ever get, and this is something that Tom told me, he told me two really great things. So I'll share this one first and then I'll tell you the other one. He said, the biggest compliment as a hair designer that you can ever get is for no one to say anything about wigs, for no one to even really like notice. If no one notices it, you did it right. So the best thing that you can hear is nothing. Yes, because- <laughs> That makes sense. The, no one's coming out being like, oh, I love the wigs. It's like, what wigs? Right. There's wigs here, you know? And yep. then the other thing, which is so true, and I think I kind of almost got to that point earlier, and it, I think it really is with anything, you know, he said to me, because we were talking about, you know, like how he got to where he is. And, and he said, Tommy, something you need to remember is your own, you will only ever be as good as the people who work for you. When you have a team of people, he's like, if, if I don't have the right people working for me, or if I have, you know, he's like, I look bad. Because it's your, you're the designer, you're the, the face, you know, they don't see like, oh, I have 10 people that made these wigs. It's like, you know, so you need to have the right, you need to find your right people and then, you know, support them because they are what make you look good. That's good advice. Not just in, in the arts, but, you know, business. Yeah. And, and they, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, and that's where it comes down to, like I was saying, like having a good hair supervisor. It's like, because as a designer, when you leave the theater, you want somebody who's going to think about the show and your design and maintain your design the same way you would if that was your job. You know, as the designer that you sat back there and you ran the show every night and you did the hair and you you want to know that that person is going to approach their, their job like it was your own. And so, I mean, it really, get yourself a good mentor, honey, because there's nothing like it. Well, I feel like that's what we have on a weekly basis with people like you, Tommy. We get uh, we get mentored for an hour. This has been uh, extremely interesting and educational. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm sorry that I talk a lot. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, but before we go, I wanted to ask you about Be an Arts Hero. Uh, you have some stuff posted on your Instagram, uh, the Be an Arts Hero uh, program. Is that something that you're involved in personally or just something you support? No, it's just something I support because I think, you know, and it was obvious and I think it was you know, this isn't about politics, whatever, every, you know, but it was very, theater was closed for over a year, you know, and it's just looking about opening up, obviously, because of the pandemic, and, you know, the number of cases, and the safety, and all that, but we, for a lot of people, it was hard to, like, be seen, and, like, get unemployment, and figure out all the necessity, as a human being, as somebody who, like, works in the arts to pay the bills, you know, like the corporate America and people that have a nine to five. and Yeah, we need all of that. But you also then need to support the people who you're going to see to enjoy your weekend with your family on a little trip, you know, like mm -hmm. you're going to see a show. It's like these people also have families and, you know, they need support and people go through stuff, you know, just because our jobs, stopped for a year doesn't mean that life stopped happening and a lot of people endured like a lot of really unfortunate things and so like being an arts hero is just you know showing that support and really just taking a minute to recognize the fact that this community exists and they need to be valued and heard and the reason I posted it and the reason I you know it's still up there is just like it's I mean it's self-explanatory no, it's true. It's a, we're all in the same community, whether we're on the West Coast, we're on the East Coast, we're on the screen, we're on the stage. Uh, and uh, that's part of the reason Greg and I launched this this podcast is to just kind of circle a wagon somewhere and have pe have a place for people to come and, and learn 
and uh, you know celebrate the arts and the things that we love. And I, I know that they're going to enjoy this interview, uh, these two interviews. Uh, we're actually going to be airing this the 28th and then the following Friday as well. So, And we're going to post your Instagram in the show notes. We're going to post the link to Be an Arts Hero and uh, also a link to info about Doubtfire and where people can get tickets. It's worth flying oh, yes. to the East Coast, folks. <laughs> Please come. And I mean, hopefully put it out there in the universe that there'll be a tour, you know, then maybe it'll come to a city near you. Boy, I hope so. And, and the next <laughs> time you're in the Seattle area, because I'm sure you'll return at some point, uh, you, you definitely look us up. Oh, yes, for sure. And then we can have you on in person. Exactly. Well, and also the same goes for you, because I know if you're, you know, you should come to New York. I'm right here. <laughs> we would love it. Definitely. Perfect. Well, thank you, Tommy. This has been great. We appreciate you making time for us. We're going to let you get back to work. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Good talking to you, too. All right. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Well, thanks again to our guest, Tommy Kurzman. You can follow Tommy and see examples of his work on Instagram at, at Tommy Kurzman Wigs. And for more information on Mrs. Doubtfire and to buy tickets for our friends of the Big Apple, visit Mrs. Doubtfirebroadway.com. And join us again next week for a new episode, Friday, June 11th, we hope to see you Saturday the 5th at 6 p.m. at the Roxy Bremerton for Rebel Without a Cause. And if you enjoy the show, make sure to follow us and share the podcast with a friend. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. We'd love to hear from you, so please join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter and email us with thoughts and comments at heilmanandhaver at gmail.com. Thank you, as always, for supporting local theater and for joining us right here on Heilman and Haver. 